Okay, Phoebes, your turn. Oh! Toilet seat covers! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Cardboard boxes, huh? I mean, is anybody interested in playing with a giant dollhouse that took me three hours to assemble? Did it come in a big box? Yeah, it did. Yeah. It came in a big two hundred dollar box. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride. Oh, what fun it is to ride. Open sleigh. Happy Christmas Eve. We are so glad you've joined us. For most kids, Christmas is a wonderful time of year with a break from school, big delicious meals, and a pile of gifts under the tree. For parents, it can be one of the most stressful times. Even now, on Christmas Eve, while I hope you are sitting there able to relax and enjoy a time of worship as a family, you may still have things to do that you're thinking about or even worrying about. Every year, it seems there are those Christmas items that everyone wants, but are really hard to get. Many of us will remember the craze around Tickle Me Elmo and Furbies. Video game consoles are often the cause of holiday gift buying stress and last minute overspending. These frantic searches for holiday items is so common that it's been joked about in sitcoms. Is that Princess Unicorn? I thought they were all sold out. They are now. Cool. Fa la 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 ka -ching. And it has even been the plot of a Schwarzenegger movie. The Doman dolls, they're all gone. But why do we spend so much effort, worry, and money searching for these hard to find gifts? I want everyone to take a minute and think back to a previous Christmas. Maybe you're thinking about visits with your grandparents. Maybe it's visiting with cousins and playing with them. But I think everyone will have memories about a Christmas gift. Maybe it's the best gift you ever got. Or maybe it's the gift you really wanted but you didn't get. Gifts are a big part of our Christmas tradition. That's one of the reasons the season can be so stressful for parents. The boxes under the tree represent enormous anticipation for kids and can end up representing hopes fulfilled or hopes unfulfilled. There's a lot of pressure to get the right gift. This evening, we're going to join the search for the greatest gift the world has ever received and explore the fulfillment this gift offers. So no matter what you might still have to do or what anxieties are weighing you down, take a few minutes during the service to relax. Enjoy a break from the Christmas hustle and refocus on what Christmas is really about. Let's discover the gift of hope.
Merry Christmas, Yorktown family. You know, gifts are a great part of Christmas. It's a delight to both give and to receive, uh, to see the wonder in the face of a child on Christmas morning, or to catch that special glint in the eye of a loved one when you capture just the right spirit in the gift that you're giving. Yet one thing that I've discovered is that all these gifts will fade over time. All of them will come up short. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it is the reality of the world in which we live. Scripture is clear that men and women were created by God in the image of God. We are created to have a deep fellowship with God and to walk with Him on a daily basis, just like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we find our purpose and our meaning in that deep fellowship. Yet when sin entered the world, that fellowship was broken, and we lost the most important part of our being. In fact, in many ways, the history of mankind since the fall has been a quest either to recover that fellowship with God or to find something uh, to replace that important part that we've lost. We instinctively recognize, whether we're believers or not, uh, that there has to be more or that something is missing. You know, as Blaise Pascal, the uh, the noted mathematician and theologian once said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man, and it cannot be filled with any created thing. It can only be filled by the Creator, by God Himself. Non-Christians may not understand that it is a God-shaped vacuum, but they definitely understand the concept of a vacuum at the very center of their being, a hole there where something is missing. Some attempt to fill it with uh, fame or fortune, with success, with uh, trying to create a legacy for themselves so that they will be remembered for generations to come. But no matter what they try to fill that hole with, it always falls short. None of those things will get the job done. As Christians blessed with the very Word of God, we understand that problem. We understand that plight better than anyone else. We know, as King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, that God has placed eternity into the hearts of men. And the problem is that we have to find that sense of God again, that we have to restore that relationship with God in order to be whole. As created beings, created to be eternal in, in fellowship with God, we have to find our rest in Him. But even as Christians, we recognize that the world that we live in 
is not our home. We yearn for the things that are eternal. We yearn for fellowship with God and for his return to create a new heaven and a new earth in which we live in that full fellowship with God unhindered by sin or by a falling world. So we recognize, like the Apostle Peter said, that we are only sojourners and exiles here for a brief time. And that everything that we see in this world, everything that we pass through is only temporary. It's transient. It doesn't last the things of this earth. As Christians, one of the reasons that we give gifts at Christmas is in recognition of the ultimate gift that was given to us through the birth of Jesus Christ. The gifts we receive on Christmas morning are wonderful, but as I just said, uh, they will not last. And the joy is not necessarily in the gift itself, but in the relationship, in the love that led to the giving. In that relationship, in that love, we reflect the greater love of God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And that's why we give in recognition of a father that gave to us the ultimate gift to restore fellowship that was once lost so that we might walk with him.
Many of us will be gathered around the tree, filled with excitement as we share the spirit of Christmas morning with our loved ones. There might be the aroma of coffee, maybe hot chocolate, or even the crackling of a fire in the background. Then there might be the sound of Christmas music, or young children laughing, or even still, the quiet peace of a Christmas morning. And then there'll be the excitement of loved ones, young and old, as they tear open boxes and look at the gifts they received. But can you imagine what it must have been like on that first Christmas morning to be walking along the streets of Bethlehem and come across this commotion? Maybe some animals stirring as a, a young mother prepares to give birth and the concern on her husband's face as he looks on. And then there lying in a manger, a newborn child. And then again, we might have kept walking. We might have had no idea what was going on because there was no grand celebration or, or royal reception for this new, newborn king. For all we know, it was just a mother, a father, and their child. That is, of course, until we hear the shepherds running down the street, and I can only imagine the excitement on their face was the same of those new parents, because they knew what was going on. And at this point, we know there was a small crowd that began to form, and people looked on and began to wonder what was going on. And then there, the shepherds revealed to everyone in attendance what they had been told. You know, as Christ followers, we know there will be a day that we have a fellowship with God. We know that because God has promised it to us. And one thing we know about God's promises is that he keeps his promises. And that is where our hope is. Our hope is in God's promises because we know he always keeps his promises. So what was the message that the shepherds revealed to everyone on that first Christmas? It was a fulfillment of a promise that we see in Isaiah 9, 6. And it says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The news that the angels delivered that evening to shepherds in a field outside of Bethlehem was the fulfillment of a promise made some 700 years earlier. And that is where we find our hope, in God's promises. And the shepherds knew exactly what would be required of this young child to fulfill the subsequent promises that God had for us. The fulfillment of a promise that is seen in Isaiah 53, seven that says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. These shepherds knew the significance of the price that this young child would pay, because these shepherds were in charge of a flock that was used for sacrifice. They were in charge of a flock whose sole purpose would be replaced by the birth of this child. And that is where we find our hope in God's promises that he always keeps. Promises like that seen in Hosea 6, 2 that says, After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. And there we see him on the third day as he presents himself to Mary. And he gives her hope in the fulfillment of one of God's promises. God always keeps his promises. That is why we can be confident in yet another promise that he makes to all of us. It's in John 14, three, and it says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Yes, the shepherds knew exactly what they were looking at that morning. It was not just a baby, not just a newborn child, but a king, a savior, the one who would fulfill God's greatest promises. And in his promises is where we realize our hope. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Luke 2, 7 through 14. The stars are brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul
We're coming to the end of our Christmas Eve service, but before we go, we're gonna have the candlelight portion of our service. If you picked up a box from Yorktown, uh, now's a good time to get those candles out and prepare those. If you didn't pick up a box, you can go grab some candles from your house and participate in the service as well. But I wanted to explain why we do the candlelight service here at Yorktown. Now we've been doing it for many years and it's, it's become sort of a tradition here, but we don't do it just because it's pretty or fun. We do it because it's symbolic. It's symbolic of the hope that we have in Christ and the light of Christ in us. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, For I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me does not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so as followers of Christ, we have the light of life, and it's our duty to share that with the world. So as you light your candle, I want you to remember the hope and the love and the light that we have in Christ. And as you lean over and light the candle next to yours, I want you to remember your responsibility to share that love with the world around you. You know, we've been talking a lot about the hope that we have in Christ, but there are many around us that don't have that hope. And it's our duty to shine love and hope into their lives so they can see what a life lived in Christ is really about. They can find the hope in Christ. And so as you light your candle tonight, as you light the candle next to yours, I want you to remember that. Thank you, Yorktown. Stop.